Development Council meeting on Tuesday, August 6th, 2013 at 7 o'clock p.m. I'll ask for confirmation of the appropriate meeting notice. The agenda was posted at Dave's Ace Hardware, Milton Piggly Wiggly, the Shaw Municipal Center, and the amended agenda was made available to the media directly. Great, thank you. At this time, I welcome all citizens. Uh, this is a chance now to address any questions or concerns that are not on the agenda. If anyone does have anything, just ask that you come forward to the podium, state your name and address, um, and then we'll hear from you now. bring to the council's attention our ideas. Uh, one is, uh, coming over here tonight, I took my wheelchair. And I've run into a few places in town. And I have a power chair, which gives me a little little more power than a manual chair of days of old. And uh, some of the ramps coming up on all the sidewalks are too steep for power chairs. Uh, you get stuck right at the bottom, your wheels start spinning, and you have to go out on the street. That's fine for somebody like me, but if you're an older person or something, you might not pay attention like you should, or, or and that sort of thing. So I just I I throw that out there for an idea. Maybe we could go around the city and take a section a year or something and just look at those situations. I'd be glad to volunteer my time to try the ramps. But you know, in the winter time, you definitely won't get up there. So uh, that's just a given. And people are going to be sitting there. Um, the second thing was an idea I had because I I love Milton. We moved here three years ago. I, I just love the city. I noticed that I can't get into some of the businesses. I realized that businesses have a choice. Uh, if they're grandfathered, they don't have to provide access. But maybe the city could consider developing a, 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 a little no interest program, no interest loan program to encourage some of the businesses to make their doors, doorways accessible. I think it does a disservice to the community and certainly a disservice to the business. So I just offer that for what it's worth. Thank you very much. Thanks, Do we have anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item three, the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? It's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to item four. We're going to do item A first, and then we'll do item D second, and then we'll go on with our business. Um, so item A is presentation by Carol Cartwright of the Historic Preservation Comprehensive Architectural Survey. Good evening, and uh, thank you for having me here to update you on the architectural and historical survey of Milton. Obviously, I don't have to tell any of you uh, what a rich architectural and historical heritage you have here in Milton. There's the Milton House, Milton College buildings, the Grout buildings in town. But I think what the purpose of the survey was to find out what else might be in Milton that has some historical interest or significance to the community and how that can possibly aid in a number of different things you might want to do to promote uh, Milton as a historic community. So uh, about a year ago, um, the Historic Preservation uh, Commission received a federal grant that was administered through the Historic Preservation Division of the Wisconsin Historical Society to conduct this intensive survey. And the purpose of the survey was to identify properties of historic uh, or architectural significance, and in particular, identify any buildings that were eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. The 
properties I've already mentioned, the Milton House, Milton College uh, buildings, the grout houses, are already listed in the National Register. So this was an opportunity to look at whether there was anything else uh, of that importance. And the reason the National Register of Historic Preservation criteria is used is because this is a federal grant and it goes through the federal offices. Uh, the National Register program is um, administered by the National Park Service. So it's basically a nationwide um, criteria that is used for all of these surveys uh, that use federal money. So just to review briefly, why do communities do this? Many times it's just to identify the historic sites they wish to preserve, um, other than what you may have already identified. One of the important things for the city government is to help comply with federal historic preservation laws for any federally funded projects. Uh, over the past 20 years or so, more and more projects get federal funding and any federal funded projects have to comply with a number of uh, rules and regulations dealing with the environment, dealing with uh, historic preservation, dealing with a lot of things. And having this report available lets you know what buildings or properties are important. And so if they fall within a project perimeter, you, you will have that, uh, the awareness of that far ahead of when other communities, and it, it saves a lot of hassle in, in the long run with uh, the federal paperwork. Also, communities do this to help in promoting their community, promoting historic tourism, heritage tourism. Um, Milton, for the size of Milton, it's one of the most historic communities in the area. And so uh, you have a national historic landmark in the Milton House. Uh, you have the Milton College buildings. What else can you use that's historic to tie into these resources and to promote the city of Milton. Um, also helping with neighborhood preservation and stabilization. Many times when houses or buildings are identified as having some historic or architectural interest, they're uh, treated with uh, a at a little higher level. People may put in extra efforts to preserve them and this leads to sometimes better maintenance, um, and things that will help stabilize neighborhoods. The other thing is if there are historic commercial buildings, many times uh, having historic districts in a downtown or historic buildings in a downtown can help with the revitalization and business growth. The process was, and I'll just briefly describe the process, uh, using what was already in the files at the Historic Preservation Office, um, I drove every street in the community, or walked, in many cases I walked, uh, all the streets in Milton, photographing any buildings or sites that had historic or architectural interest or any that had already been identified in the survey. Then I researched the surveyed buildings in the historic tax uh, records that are at the Rock County Courthouse, and I was looking for dates of construction, original owners, so that I could, uh, that would aid me in doing research. Then I conducted um, research on the most significant properties, the ones that were either identified as important locally or eligible for the National Register. All of this information is eventually entered into the Historic Preservation Database, which is a database that you can access, the public can access uh, a version of it through the Wisconsin Historical Society website, wisconsinhistory.org, or no, maybe wisconsinhistoricalsociety.org. One of those. <laughs> and uh, going into historic buildings and preservation. And so in a few months, um, if you want to see the buildings and updated pictures that I took, um, then you will be able to do so. The last thing is to write the report, which is a combination of a historic report and a planning report. It, um, the draft, I know, has been circulating around, and um, that draft uh, will be uh, is being finalized, printed, along with uh, illustrations, uh, photographic illustrations that will help you in, you know, what 
I say something, well, it's important as a Queen Anne house. Well, what is a Queen Anne house? So there'll be a picture there to help people, one or two pictures. Um, probably for many of you, you may be interested in a number of the historic chapters that I wrote. One of the things in the report is placing the properties within a context, either architecturally or historically. So there's a large architecture chapter, but there's also chapters on um, commerce, uh, government, um, education, transportation, et cetera, depending on the buildings that were identified in the survey. But many of you are probably going to be interested <laughs> primarily in, in the second to the last chapter, which is the results chapter. And that's going to be the listing of what was found. And the results chapter includes properties that are already listed in the National Register, properties that have been listed under your local Historic Preservation Commission ordinance as landmarks, and then probably the most important thing uh, for going forward are properties that were identified as eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. I use the National Register criteria for eligibility decisions. However, all properties that I identify are verified or reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office and by the head of the Historic Buildings Division of, of that office. And so um, if I think something is eligible and he does not, then unfortunately it goes into the pile of local interest. <laughs> um, I can't do anything about that. That's just the way the, sy the, way the system works. They have the final say. Um, so what was briefly, what were the results? There were 12 additional individual properties identified as eligible for the National Register. Now some, uh, a few are ones that you might think about uh, as you're driving around town, such as the Chambers House at uh, John Paul Road and, and Madison, or the Seventh-day Baptist Church that would be eligible for architecture, uh, the Masonic Temple, for example. But there were a few others that you might think um, might be unusual for being eligible for the National Register. Uh, one property that you have in Milton that's quite unique is an intact farmstead. Most uh, communities within their boundaries, uh, farm buildings have been lost. In the case of this property, it's historically the W.H. Gray farmstead on High Street, just a little bit down the road. It uh, You've seen a very nice house, but many of you maybe have not seen all of the agricultural buildings. It has a dairy barn, a silo, um, granary, a uh, small animal building, something that as you go around the rural areas, you know that farms are rapidly disappearing. So what we look for are these intact farmsteads that represent the growth and development of farming. So that's a unique resource you have here. Um, what I call the Jones Block or the Courier Building, it's where the local newspaper has been published for over 100 years. Uh, it has, um, it's not necessarily architecturally significant, but it is significant for its association with this local newspaper and the publication of this in the community. So those are just a couple examples. The other maybe most significant areas uh, that were identified were two small historic districts in each of the commercial areas. The first one, uh, for lack of a better term, and this can certainly be changed, um, is the Parkview Historic District, which is, of course, a number of the buildings along Parkview uh, Drive that are uh, in what I've called Old Milton to identify it from the Old Milton Junction area. Um, that is a group of buildings, uh, three on Parkview and uh, five on College Street, making a small historic district there. The other is, of course, in the Old Milton Junction uh, that I've called Merchant Row Historic District. That includes four buildings on Merchant Row and three buildings on Vernal Avenue. And again, the determination of the boundaries, what buildings were in, what buildings were out, were largely determined by the 
gentleman from the State Preservation Office. Again, they have very uh, severe criteria as to what they include. And um, so that those two were identified. And of course, identifying these small historic districts may be something of interest to the local government and to citizens, business people, because historic districts that are put in the National Register of Historic Places qualify for historic preservation tax credits, which are quite popular with uh, for rehabbing historic buildings. Many times uh, uh, building owners can piggyback uh, community incentives and historic tax credits kind of in a package format to help rehab buildings. So it's something that, that you may be interested in doing. And if you, I'm only giving you, I know you have a long meeting, so I'm just giving you a, a brief overview. The, the only other um, list that's in that results chapter is actually a list of properties that, for whatever reason, uh, primarily by, I'll pass the buck to the, to the state guy, <laughs> that have, do not meet the historic uh, the National Register criteria. And however, they are of strong local interest. Um, for example, there is the um, George Post House. Again, just right across the way, it's old Dr. Dr. Uh, Post's house, which just because of a small architectural detail, the state guy was not did not approve that for eligibility. However, it's an important local a house and might be of interest to locally land market because it does have a good um, unusual architectural style as well as Dr. Post was a significant uh, person in the community in the early 20th century. Um, the Chicago, Milwaukee and St. Paul, St. Paul Railroad Depot, which is again, not too far away from here. That has a lot of historic significance, not just because of the old railroad depot, but because there was an effort by uh, community members to make that a community house uh, many years ago, almost within the period of significance, which is 50 years. So that's something that while because of uh, some architectural changes was not eligible for the National Register is certainly of interest to uh, the local, um, uh, local community. Um, there's a very interesting house at 974 East High Street, which is way out on the end of High Street, almost at the city limits. It's a small white house, square, sits on a triangular lot. It was built as an AT&T test station. Uh, uh, the lineman for the fledgling uh, telephone service in the community lived there, but he also had a number of uh, unusual electrical devices that were there to uh, experiment with, and this was written up in the newspaper, and so it's quite an interesting, locally uh, interesting property. So finally, if you want to find out more and see a couple of great PowerPoint presentations, hopefully they'll be great, <laughs> um, I'm going to give a much more detailed presentation on the results of the survey, as well as Joe DeRose from the State Preservation Office will be coming to discuss uh, the National Register of Historic Places because that's the next step that the commission is taking in the grant for next year. Uh, or for this coming year. And that meeting will be held a week from tomorrow, the 14th, I believe is the date, at the Milton House at, uh, I believe it's 6.30. So hopefully you will all be able to come and, re you know, and, and at that point you can see the finished published report, you can ask questions, et cetera, and uh, go over uh, whatever it is you'd like to discuss at that time. That's it for now. Are there any questions or? Thank okay, you very much. thank you. <clears throat> we will move on to uh, the former item 4D, discussion and possible action regarding ordinance 383, amending section 14.
concerning prohibited practices of direct sellers. What we'll do is I'll have uh, administrator Sh I'll have administrator shoots um, give us a brief overview of the action that the council took at the last meeting to direct uh, the drafting of an ordinance. He'll indicate some of the feedback that we've had. At that point, it will be um, open for council debate uh, on this subject. I'm aware that there's probably some folks who have some thoughts on this. Um, one thing that we will not have tonight is any discussion of specific businesses. Um, this is an issue that, as you all know, has been ongoing for um, just a little over a year at this point. Um, it uh, truly should be a public policy debate and not a debate over uh, specific individuals or specific businesses. So we will uh, limit our conversation to that. Um, I can enforce it um, to a point um, on the, the folks up here, but um, obviously the folks in the audience, uh, if we do take public comment, you are free to say whatever you like. I would just ask that you uh, respect um, that kind of parameter. So with that, Jerry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as indicated in the memo that was distributed to you uh, yesterday afternoon, pursuant to council direction at the July 16th meeting, uh, Attorney Trader did draft an ordinance that would restrict direct sellers uh, and what are have been often now become referred to as mobile business service providers uh, from utilizing public property. That means uh, public parking lots, city parks. Uh, so that restriction, that ordinance, that draft ordinance was prepared for you tonight for your review by Attorney Schrader. Uh, since that July 16th meeting, we've had considerable public input, phone calls, some emails, uh, stop-in appointments, and uh, I have put together and a policy alternative for your consideration in addition to consideration of the complete outright ban. Uh, and that is outlined in a memo that I'll just quickly walk through because I know there's been a lot of, a lot of uncertainty among the community. Uh, this particular issue's got a, a lot of media attention going way back to uh, May of 2012 when we addressed the, the then the taco truck issue. I, I know as the mayor has indicated that um, we feel it very, very important that the discussion be limited to this being an issue of public policy and what the council wants to do and not, doesn't want to permit uh, on its public lands, uh, that being public parking and, and the city's parks. So in particular, I'll just quickly walk through the highlights of that memo uh, that it's important that the community remember that there would be no restrictions on direct purchase businesses who work with mobile service providers. Some members in the community had called expressing concerns that what about uh, um, the landscaping businesses, the um, the dog groomer that comes to my house and those sorts of things. This proposed ordinance does not restrict nor regulate those types of businesses, just so the community has an understanding of that. Um, that the restriction that is being discussed tonight in a proposed uh, ban of mobile businesses and direct sellers on city properties would really be for public properties and public parking only. That's the only thing that we're talking about. Um, if the council were to choose to regulate this on private properties, um, it would need to do so through its zoning code. And so there are some certain zoning code restrictions already that apply to certain things that are either what are known as permitted or conditionally permitted use. And very similar to our code as it pertains to city properties, this particular, trans this particular ordinance does not regulate private properties. It's only related to public properties. Um, and last but not least, the, the third point of that memo, which kind of goes into those alternatives, because at the July 16th meeting, we did present alternatives to the council that included either permitting them on public properties under certain established guidelines and parameters that <coughs> exist for the nearly any city permit or the outright ban. And the council's uh, discussion on July 16th and direction was to have Attorney Schrader draft a proposed ordinance that would be the ban. Um, after listening to that citizen input, one of the things that really resonated with me was that there are things about the city of Milton that people really, really enjoy about what we'll call the Milton experience. And they are unique experiences that people enjoy in our city parks. They enjoy it in our businesses. And there are certain experiences that you can only get in the city of Milton. And uh, some of those things that people talked to me about um, were the enjoyment of experiences that they have at our permanently established businesses, but also some experiences that they've had in other communities at mobile businesses. Um, and whether they be fair types of situations or whether they be farmers markets or whether they be experiences in other communities, not even in Wisconsin or Rock County, but um, experiences that because of the unique nature of our community, we don't want to restrict those opportunities for those experiences 
things like maybe the, a mini donut trailer or a ke the kettle corn company who might want to come and, into a, a rejuvenated Goodrich Square, that an outright ban may potentially just completely eliminate those opportunities and those experiences for children and families and adults to enjoy. Uh, so as we set public policy for what uh, w we would permit or not permit on city properties and public parking, uh, staff worked together to try to, uh, along with discussions that I've had with the mayor, about trying to come up with an appropriate balance that would um, ensure that adequate public parking exists. Uh, at 10 to 6 tonight, I had a phone call about somebody expressing concerns already about public parking and, and how this might impact that. Um, yet at the same time, affording an opportunity for experiences that we feel people might potentially enjoy in our community. And so by either using this permit process and potentially restricting the number of them via a quota, if you will, or a limit on the number of mobile businesses may help to ensure that they don't inundate city properties or public parking unnecessarily and then limit those uh, public parking and, and city properties to only their use, but that they would be permitted under a permit process. So we feel that, uh, or I feel at least I should say that that balance would appropriately address public parking and city property concerns while still affording citizens the opportunity to enjoy experiences that may be prohibited if there was an outright ban. So are you talking about um, designating specific parking areas? Is that something that, that we would do then, say like parking stall A and B in this area you could get a permit for? No. Um, what, what I would suggest instead would be that um, similar to what was presented in the July 16th memo that the ordinance itself, the law would permit uh, mobile businesses through a technical review and that technical review would then eventually come to the council for approval or denial of a permit and that would look at such things like um, the amount of public parking that the mobile businesses would take up, the duration of the business hours and all of the other things that are, that are outlined in the memo, the hours of operation would be restricted, um, all those sorts of things that we would do uh, when a, a regular business would apply for either a conditional use permit or a, a, business, not, a business license application that is not applicable, but um, all of the zoning considerations that would be taken into account for a permanent business. Uh, the fee is also appreciably higher in that we establish a $500 fee, um, in meaning that um, a person who's going to make that level of investment has to make sure that they're a, a proper fit from a public safety and public land use standpoint. Um, and, and that's really the, the driving force behind either an approval or a denial of the, the mobile business permit. So if we granted um, a mobile business a mobile business permit, then they could um, go anywhere they would like on city property. Is that essentially what you're saying? What staff would propose is that um, they would come to us with a plan of what they intend to do, and then we would see if uh, um, through a technical review process, which includes our public works director, I would argue in this case, depending on the, on the business that submits, we would also include consultation from the police chief or representative from his department um, and the administrator from the zoning perspective, and we would look at what they intend to do and where they intend to do it and then see if adequate public parking, public safety issues are appropriately addressed, uh, pedestrian safety getting to and from the business is taken into consideration. And then after that technical review committee, which meets twice a month, uh, we would make a recommendation to the council as to whether or not um, this would be, uh, would meet the re technical requirements of a permit. So am I understanding that this permit identifies the location that is permitted, that it's not a citywide, if you don't like this parking lot, you can go to another parking lot? Correct. We, we would encourage the mobile business uh, to present to us where they intend to do their business, and it might be multiple locations, and hence the term mobile. So they may say, we, we'd like to park Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in on Parkview Drive, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays in Merchant Row on public parking. I intend to take up one stall. I'm going to have one employee. My trailer is 8 by 12, and we'll be open from noon to 5 selling hot pretzels and mustard or whatever. And then we would look at that and say, okay, well, where they're intending to park, is there adequate, um, you know, crosswalks, and is public safety concerns addressed? Um, does it meet our, 
you know, you'll see in the memo that does it meet the requirements related to noise? Does it address all any, any and all possible concerns that we may have related to the use of public property? And if we feel that it would, then we would come and recommend approval. If we feel that, you know, it's a it's a 50-foot trailer that's going to take up seven stalls and potentially going to jeopardize the availability of public parking or it's going to be un unusually loud or, um, or, or things like that that would be inconsistent with the, the district, then we would recommend denial. Um, so that there would be a vetted out criterion based on appropriate use of public property and then we would either recommend approval or denial based on that technical review. Would there be a... a a range for their fees, for example, if someone's going to be there on an ongoing basis, that's one thing with regard to their fees. If they're only coming once or twice as part of a, let's say it's somebody's coming to sell kettle corn for the three concerts during the summer, I mean, that's to pay $500 for just three visits would be an exceptional fee. Certainly. Um, but if the, I don't know, the zoning board or whoever is going to make the approval had that ability to, to make a range. Um, we did not present that as an option in the in this original proposal, but it's certainly one that would make sense. So we could certainly do that. Does that mean they'll have the, the availability to go to any park for their trailers? We would ask that that be presented in the in the original application, where you intend to go, when you intend to be there. And then that is where you would be approved to do your business. So that would be a part of the approval process. So you would be restricted to the, where the permit allows you to go. I don't see how you're going to pick and choose who can, you know, fare away in, in our parking in, in our downtown are so at premium now we don't have, mm -hmm. especially with the sports park. Um, so could your technical review committee um, recommend approval and then the city council deny it? And then what sort of appeal process is there? Um, well, I, I would encourage that if you wanted to have the uh, public hearing part of the, the review process or permit process, we could certainly add that to it. In, in terms of an appeal process, I'd have to defer to Attorney Schrader what it would be if we deny someone's permit. I think if it was based on um, criteria and that was established to say um, this particular application uh, takes up an undue amount of, of parking based on the type of nature of business and what you anticipate would be a traffic flow that would come in as a result of the business going there, then that's why we're denying because there's not adequate public parking or there's, there's not... Um, there's not adequate pedestrian traffic flow to that business, whatever the reason may be, so long as they were appropriately cited, similar to when we would deny a conditional use permit or deny a variance or, or anything else. Um, I think so long as the denial was consistent with reasons for approval or denial, that we would be okay. And Mark, you can... Yes, the, the, uh, the ordinances being discussed here would contain criteria for the technical review committee and the Common Council to apply in determining whether or not to grant a permit, and if so, uh, what restrictions should be applied. If it were, as an example, if it were denied by the Common Council, then most often the uh, remedy for the applicant would be to file an, a uh, writ of certiorari action in circuit court, and ask that that be reviewed to see if the uh, Common Council. Um, uh, in conducting its review um, uh, didn't fulfill its obligation to uh, do so in, an, in a, an appropriate manner, basically, to see whether it was uh, representing its will and not its reasoned judgment. So that would be the remedy that um, any individual has if they're dissatisfied with an action of the Common Council <coughs> or any delegated official for granting or denying a permit. They, they always have that option to file a writ of certiorari action to have that reviewed. And so when the, the taco truck first started, was it one in the town and one in the new location? How would this apply to the new location of the new location? 
we would anticipate and, and in essence require that a person is permitted to do their business where they tell us they're going to do their business at the time of permit issuance. Okay, so, so, so it stays with that. And if it, there's right. No so you, so right. So your permit is so you can do it here or you can do it there. And if you're doing it anywhere else, you would be in violation of the permit. And then if they're in violation of the permit, what's the remedy to that? Uh, we would propose either a, a revocation or a suspension of the permit based on violation. And then does that require, do they get a hearing on that? Or what procedure is established for revoking a permit? We have a licensing process that is similar to this. No, we, we, re we really do not. I mean, the direct seller's permit is the only other one that is similar. And we've never had an issue with anyone violating it. So, I mean, we've not had people out at like 2 o'clock in the morning banging on doors or anything. So, um We'd be in somewhat of an unchartered territory, and my suspicion is we would work through a, a, a progressive process by which we would first tell them, hey, you're violating your permit. The second one would be we're either going to non-issue or we'd establish a process to revoke it. I apologize. I wasn't here for the discussion on the uh, 16th, but have we, to ensure that we're not being reactionary to issues that arose as part of the um, the Splash Parker, we, have we looked into uh, policies that have been a part of other communities with Splash Parks or uh, waiting pools and things uh, to, to ensure the safety of those types of uh, projects? Yes, um, and, and Michelle did some research, uh, Whitewater. Milton is unique in that we have a, a Splash Park in a downtown district. Some of the other communities have them in, in parks that are um, much further away from their businesses. So um, I can tell you that Whitewater regulates um, private property through its zoning code. That's a conversation that Michelle and I have had. Uh, in a meeting that I had with the uh, City of Janesville staff today, uh, they said that we don't really think that we allow them on public property anyway, our, but because our, our, our code is silent. We don't allow them or permit them, which is what like Milton's code was. Um, so. Um, Madison, which is a much, very, very much different market, they have an incredibly restrictive code, but they're also dealing with the square. So we looked at that. Um, and other, most other communities have said that this has been arguably a blessing and a curse exclusively to the city of Milton. Um, so, <laughs> But they want yeah. our results. Yes. Yeah, they, 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 they <laughs> share what you find. What we are ha what's happening with us. So a lot of other communities have codes that are silent on it. Um, and and in, in part because I think... Um, to all the person Striegel's comment, you, you know, what, what will happen? I want to remind the council we've had two inquiries in 15 months about this very issue. So um, I, I do not think that uh, the council or staff will be inundated with mobile businesses, but I do think we should have a well thought out, well established procedure and policy for when these situations do come up, what you will seek to permit and what you will seek to not permit in the city. That's why I want to be careful that we don't just react to the two requests and respond in, in, in defense of those. We want to make sure that it's that we think through all types of them and all types of situations, not just in terms of that end of town. I mean, sure. it could happen anywhere, and we need to be able to be objective to the situations. I completely agree. One of the things that we talked about with Attorney Schrader today, and, and we haven't done yet because we wanted to see how encompassing or not encompassing you wanted to be with this particular code of ordinances, is an agricultural vendor permit. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, you know, great local uh, agricultural producers who may wish to sell um, in the city, whether it be on public property. We, I know we have a relationship with one vendor already who does an exceptional job for which we've never had any complaints about. And, uh, and there may be others who want to come into town based on what they see in pedestrian or vehicular traffic. And so permitting an agricultural vendor permit, uh, that may be a type of mobile business permit that you want to get. Someone who wants to permanent, I don't want to say permanently establish, but establish a longer term um, seasonal business in, in an area where there's a lot of vehicular and pedestrian traffic. And certainly the investments we've made in Goodrich Park would suggest that there may be more who wish to do that. Um, so we, we, we try to be more holistically because I, uh, in looking at this ordinance to establish some sort of a limit or criterion or, but then there's also deviations that could include an agricultural vendor permit. Some communities have those, um, which allow that seasonal sales, um, or you could encompass that into whatever ordinance you direct staff to, 
to adopt tonight. I, I should have mentioned um, Alderman Verwink is on the phone with us um, too, so feel free to chime in at any point. Um, I think there's probably a. I go I ahead, Jeff. To say when, I, when there's the opportunity. Go ahead. Well, the one thing I want us to think about is that when we if we create an ordinance, is that what would happen if the Chamber of Commerce wants to create um, uh, a farmers market like one day a week, uh, and you know all kind of and they have businesses pay them to buy a space. Let's say let's say when like twenty old oh, twenty six or when twenty six is bypassed, and if you want to create a farmers market on twenty six, would that be considered public property? And should those people have to be licensed? If they come one day a week, if we create a farmer's market for them, I think uh, if, if they only come to the farmer's market and they already pay the chamber, for example, for a space, I mean, I think the ordinance should create an exception for a larger entity like a farmer's market that might be part of a bigger one night thing that happens maybe, you know, once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want the council to consider that. Because I think, because I have talked to the chamber about creating a larger farmer's market. Once the once the 26 bypass goes through, about businesses or about creating a farmers market on a weeknight, when uh, uh, to bring in vendors because I think it'd be a good thing for the city of Milton, and so I don't want our ordinance to be prohibited to that. So that's something I want them to consider. So well, this ordinance is written specifically states that it does not apply to agricultural vendors. If it might not just it might not just be agricultural things though, because in larger farmers markets there are other sometimes there's other vendors who come in so i mean that, that's just something i want us to think about that we don't exempt those kind of things i mean that we don't prohibit those kind of things if they're part of the larger farmers market so like maybe arts and crafts or something that might be sold at a farmers market sometimes those i've seen i've been down the Boyd's farmers market i've been to janesville's um and sometimes they are part of that for that one day just so would this prohibit, like, if we ever wanted to do, like, um, an art fair with, on the square that we might have someday, would that prohibit that? A complete ban, yes. I, I, I guess I would like to ask Mark if we created an ordinance that that would affect if, we had, if they were part of a largest farmer's market that was organized by a city group. Well, you, you can craft an ordinance um, to permit such a thing as it's currently drafted. It's drafted, as, as Jerry noted, rather broadly so that it, it doesn't allow the, uh, the selling of, of products on any public property except for raw agricultural produce or stands operated by charitable organizations. So that's how it's written right now. So um, if you want to provide for those type of events, I think you would want to address that. Um, they, they aren't, um, certainly aren't direct sellers. And, and I know that's what uh, the, the the uh, challenges are not direct sellers. I mean, they're not, they're not going door to door and, and direct selling. And that's the challenge that I know the city has run into here is that exactly how do we categorize these type of businesses. And so to date, they've applied the direct seller permit because it's really the one that best, only one that can arguably apply. Um, but um, I think if, if the council does want to permit certain things to happen on public property, it, it does need to make sure that it addresses this in a way so as to permit that. You can do that. This ordinance, which again is, is a part of the direct seller's permit process, wouldn't, wouldn't permit it. Um, and even though it, it's arguably not a direct seller operation, they, they are and not really a mobile business either. So I guess I'd have to think about to what extent um, those type of activities would be regulated by this because it's really not either. I mean, that's one reason I think that you're looking to permit the stands is that they're, they're ni neither direct sellers nor are they mobile businesses. Um, so we'd have to see how that fits in here. Well, my concern is that we don't have 
like we have a farmer's market and we have 40 vendors that we don't have to get a, go through a permit process for each one. That would be time consuming and, and I think counterproductive. Mark makes, a, Mark makes a good point. We can craft an ordinance to say whatever we like, to have whatever exclusions we want. But the core, the basic question is, do, uh, does the council wish to adopt an ordinance that prohibits mobile vendors entirely? If that is the case, we can move on. If we want to start discussing some of the, the idiosyncrasies and the specifics, then we can have that discussion too. So I guess now would be a good time to hear from the people who um, would advocate for um, a complete or nearly complete ban um, on the council. I, I do want to just um, interject one thing that I do know that Fort Atkinson and Jefferson do allow mobile businesses and those are communities that we that were not mentioned but they they both allow mobile businesses first of all <coughs> My name is Rollin Natter, 2507 Grandview at Milton. I've got four things I'd like to state for you that I have seen go on in the past three or four years. The first one is, uh, I just want to talk about the interstate first as it has to do with the businesses in this community. Uh, two years ago in November, the Milton Courier, uh, Milton Courier for the Milton House had a nice letter in the paper. What a wonderful thing the interstate will do for the city of Milton. I did write her a letter and uh, tell her that she is totally uninformed about the city and what it will do to the city. And if you want to turn around and look now at Fort and Jefferson and that way, go back a little bit, go to Portage, go all the way north and see all the cities that are sitting vacant in their buildings. Now you're talking about, <coughs> she was talking about how much business it would bring. Yeah, it'll bring it, but they're going past it. They're not going to come in and build a business in town and come in to do it because if they're going to a destination, that's where they're going to go. That's the first thing about it because the number of cities that are all vacant buildings downtown. You can do it right around your own community. In Milton, Milton Junction, Janesville, Whitewater, and any of the rest of them. You've got all kinds of places for people who want to go into business. They can buy the property or they can rent from the people who do have the property. And they, they pay all the taxes along with it and they pay all of the health department and insurance that's necessary for different businesses. And uh, when they turn around and, and uh, uh, want to see, I'd like to see a, a council be tough and say no to something that comes up just because it's a hair scheme, hair scheme uh, that they want to get into business. I can tell you every one of the <coughs> people I've met from Fisher Body Chevrolet during my 50 years on, in business in Janesville, they all wanted to have a, a root beer stand. They thought that was the greatest thing in the world. They could go to work in the summertime, put their wife to work and all the rest of it, and their kids could go to school and they'd have a new car, then they'd go back to the plant. They, a few of them started, and they found out it was a little more work than what they anticipated. But to... <laughs> to shoot down your business people in this community and turn around and let someone park, you're talking about parking. I don't think you people even know what you have to pay for parking when you're in some of these places. You can't just go in and say, have seven stalls and think of that's gonna make you rich. Forget that. Every business is buying now their properties with, um, Parking on the side. If they don't get it, they'll go someplace else. And all you have to do is read the paper. Read the paper on uh, Milton Avenue this past few days. <clears throat> uh, now, I, I got I sh I to shoot a couple of barbs here at the council. I called the newspaper 
yesterday morning in um, the junction and asked when this meeting was going to be. I looked in last week's paper. There is no notice whatsoever on this meeting tonight. Look at it. I want to ask the question, why isn't the city council getting their agenda into that newspaper on a weekly basis? Is there a problem with it? Does it cost money? That's one thing. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention that uh, when getting back to the interstate on this again, about the land that you've got at the interstate, I even came up and talked to Mr. Schultz about that one time when it was first coming out as to what you were going to do with the land. <coughs> and uh, uh, you told me that uh, you were interested in a motel. I talked to him, I was interested. At uh, next day or so in the paper, uh, you mentioned that the city council was going to spend $16,000 for a uh, over, uh, take a look to see if it would work. Do you realize all the motels we have in this country and they would do it for free? They would come and inspect your property and if you were worth it, they would take, get that property bought so fast to make your head swim. Now, I'm just talking about some of these things and we're talking about the parking of small businesses in someone else's land and other parking to boot and think you're going to be able to, to keep track how many parking places they have and how many are parked somewhere else. This isn't going to work. Anyway, that's... Uh, I've got some others on that, but I'll uh, leave you with my thoughts about the newspaper once a week. With, I think we, uh, if we're buying a newspaper, we should find out what they've got. And one thing, I've always had a, uh, a little... Uh, conscious about by going to uh, township meetings, city council, or wherever it is, you have a beautiful set of microphones. You got about $7,000 in those. But, you know, sometimes when you stand this far back, you can't hear you. These people don't know what you're saying. Just a little jab. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, anyone on the council um, like to speak uh, on the question of allowing or disallowing uh, mobile businesses? Not the specifics, but the general question. Well, I wanted to wait to see if there's anybody else had anything to say for it. It's not what I had to say. Okay, at that point, we'll open it up to any further public comment. Just please remember to state your name and address. Hi, my name is Tracy Thompson and I live on Six Corners Road outside of Melton. And um, I just want to say thank you to the administrator for coming up with some options because I am for mobile businesses coming in to Milton. Um, I, I really enjoy eating out of food trucks and I think that would be a really great thing to bring some culture and some great revenue dollars into this town. And not to mention, I'd like to be one of those people that have a mobile business and I want to come and park it in the town that I live in and get some revenue too. So. No offense to those folks that don't, but I, you know, I think we need to welcome that kind of thing. Thank you. My name is Tim Thompson, and I have the same address as her, my beautiful wife. Um, I think it's pretty simple, actually. If we've got, well, first of all, I'm never a fan of any law denying other Americans the option to do something. And it may seem trivial for a mobile business, but the minute you put a law into place denying them, it's just about impossible. And we all know it, it's just about impossible to backtrack and redo that if an art fair on the square or something like that ever comes up. You've got two options. Option A is to ban them completely. Option B is to review them case by case. We've had two inquiries in 15 months. If you don't have the time to review them, um, there's people that do. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, 
I'm Jolyn Burden with the uh, Milton Chamber of Commerce. I'm the executive director. And I guess I just wanted to come tonight to reiterate um, some information that was shared yesterday with Mayor Frazier and uh, Mr. Schutz via email. Just in that, with the heightened awareness, um, obviously, of this issue coming, um, we as an executive committee met yesterday morning. And we did decide that we have a board meeting next Monday morning um, on the 12th at 8 AM with our full board. And our recommendation from the executive committee is to take it to our full board for review so that we are representing our member um, businesses here in town. So I'm just here tonight. Um, we don't have an official statement meant to share um, with the council tonight that represents our members, but we will, as of, uh, take it into consideration after next Monday morning and uh, share with the rest of you. But I guess I'm here tonight to ask you to um, hold off on making that decision on a full ban tonight and to take into consideration some of the other things that have been discussed here. And um, hopefully that we will provide more of a clear um, understanding um, from our members on how they feel about this. We have been talking with quite a few of them um, via um, conversations and via email, and hopefully after our full board review next Monday, we will have a statement from our chamber. Thank you. Hi, most of you know me. I'm Mark Warren. I'm co-owner of American Awards and Promotions in Milton on the uh, College Street. And uh, I'm also currently the chair of the uh, board of directors for the Milton Chamber of Commerce. I am not here to talk on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce until, as you heard, uh, we meet and then we will come back and, and provide you uh, what we feel uh, is appropriate at that time. Uh, so um, at this time, I want to, on my own behalf, and not for the chamber, uh, state a few things. I'm going to put the bottom line up front. I request that uh, you discuss this issue like you have been tonight. And then I request that you unanimously vote to table it for at least one month. Clearly, there's been a lot of uh, publicity on this, a lot of input. Um, that uh, has been given, and I don't think even after discussing it tonight that you're anywhere near the right resolution. So I would ask that you would table this and continue to discuss it and get this, the input from the citizens of Milton and also the business community on this business-related issue. By tabling it, I don't believe that there's gonna be any safety issue at least I haven't heard of any. Has anybody here heard of an issue specifically right now that is a safety issue because of this? I don't think it's gonna be a parking issue because from what I understand, there's one business that might want to do this. Is one parking spot going to cause a big parking issue immediately that we can't wait? Is there a significant business competition issue? I haven't seen it. Um, is there a cost to the city if you table it? I can't understand what it would be. If you uh, notice from your packet uh, last month or last uh, council meeting in your packet, I read that there were three to five email and phone call inquiries to date. That's over over a year's time. Is it gonna upset the people of the community if you table this for another month? If you checked uh, the courier poll that they had just recently, there's a lot of opposition for you moving ahead. Last night it was 85.9% opposition for moving forward to banning completely as the ordinance is written. Uh, if you check the Jamesville Gazette this morning, the uh, opinion was, you're moving a little fast on this. Consider what you're doing. So I'm actually prepared to answer all sorts of questions or give you my feeling on safety, on parking areas, on business competition, on all sorts of issues, including even the fee structure of the $500 that's being proposed but I don't think it's worth it right now because I don't think 
you should move forward with this. So once again, I ask that you table this, consider it much more than you already have. Thank you. I do want to point out for clarification's sake, tabling uh, the proposed ordinance essentially continues our current prohibition of um, mobile businesses since they do not have a license. <coughs> Didn't think I'd be back here this soon. Um, Robert Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y. I've seen my name spelled wrong uh, several times in the last couple weeks that I didn't know it was going to be in the Gazette. I'm co-owner of Cone Zone with my wife, Michelle. You know, I'm sorry it's come to this. I didn't think it would be this uh, big a deal. I didn't think it would be in the Gazette all this time. I didn't think it would be on what I still call talk of the town yesterday. Uh, there was a couple, like one misquote in one of the articles that said I demanded a uh, business plan. All I asked for was a business plan for these mobile units. Um, is Milton really anti-business without adding these mobile vendors. What this town needs is industry to be brought in to draw people to get here to work for these bigger companies. As soon as I heard that the Blackhawk Tech was coming to town, I thought, oh my gosh, what a great move for the city of Milton. And uh, my wife did I got to keep my glasses on here. My wife did call the radio station yesterday and got to say her point on this. And the uh, announcer host, he, he told her one thing, and I'm not going to repeat it, but it's, it's what my dad always told me. He said to stand up for what you believe. We have a vested interest and investment in our building that we put up on West High Street. And there's one other thing. He told me, don't do anything for spite. Make sure you think everything through. And one, one thing I have, it's, I know this is going to cost me money, is the Milton Chamber of Commerce. We've been in business since July 1st. I'm going to look at the date of 2011. Nobody has approached us to become members. Nobody. And uh, when I was in business in Janesville, every year someone was knocking at my door. They wanted their fees, and we were glad to be members. You know, I don't even know where it's, uh, where it's located here in town. So, you know, if... You want to contact us, you'll find us at 444 West High Street. Be happy to be a member. Uh, and uh, last time you guys talked about fees, licenses, and you prorated our portion of our taxes at $900 to the city. I talked to Mike across the street at the Red Zone. He pays almost 2000 more a year. So it, 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 business, you have to average out all the uh, taxes before you can make a fee. And I wanted to just, uh, I think maybe like Mike, is Mike Warren? Mark Warren said table. We need a lot more discussion on this. I think like in Edgerton on the corner, I'm not sure the corner, it's kitty corner from a, the first stoplight in town, a little Mex Mexican restaurant went in there within the last year. He's doing very well up there. I've heard nothing but good things about the place. We have the storefronts here that, you know, you guys talk about the taco truck that I believe we need to market these buildings for these kind of businesses. 
I um, think I'm done. Because <laughs> I know we just are not, uh, you know, we're not doing just specific. We're doing all mobile vendors. So if you have any questions. Yep, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Beth Drew from Charming Bees Coffee and More at 819 East High Street. Um, I would like to dovetail on what Mr. Warren said ev this evening in that I do feel that this warrants more attention. And an outright ban of mobile businesses at this point in time would be kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Um, that being said, um, and I realize that that's specifically, those are the two choices this evening. Um, however, if your choice is to go forward with pursuing a mobile business ordinance. Um, I would also like to submit um, the idea of that, that I feel should be part of it is that uh, we should also look at the re-permitting process, the annual re-permitting process necessary for this. Currently, um, as Mark had said, that um, waiting a month or longer is not going to make a huge deal to in this in this particular um, uh, subject. The uh, the summer has been absolutely gorgeous. We've had a couple of cool days recently, but the Splash Park is in full swing. I saw so many children and so many families utilizing that park today. It was an awesome experience. But that being said, the the season is almost over. We're almost going back to school. And so therefore, I feel that there is time. Time is on the council's side if you go forward with this. However, in the, in the manner of business that we're discussing here, so right now, if we, and I don't mean to talk specifically about an ice cream truck, and my apologies for that, but selling those individually packed novelties, we do not have to have a health permit, a health department permit. So currently, I'm able to utilize my own property to do that. But past that, any business that I talked about last month that would sell a product that, that was either made on the premises or in another commercial kitchen would have to have a health department certification. So Tammy at Red Rooster, even though she only sells hand-packed ice cream, has to have that same $500 permit. I would have to sell, have a $500 permit to sell anything other than a prepackaged novelty out of an ice cream truck. So that being said, if perhaps you'd come up with a $500 fee for the city, couple that with a $500 fee from the health department, we're looking at $1,000. And all other costs aside, I understand property taxes. That's not for me to discuss with you at this point in time. However, I'd love to share that with you. Um, just having paid them last week. But that being said, um, I, would, I would submit that we need to do this like before the season would start so that in November of the year prior, I know that in January, February, March, April, whenever I'm interested in opening up shop, that I can do that. So that would be one suggestion that I would have for you. And I'll let you continue to talk. Everybody gets one swing at the pitch tonight. So. Only one? Uh, only one. <laughs> One that one one swing tonight. Uh, well, I had to do. I just wanted to. I'm so, I'm sorry. If I if I let you do yours, then oh, Mark's going to jump up and everyone's going to jump up. Oh, the Tolman House, how they have that every year at Arts Festival. We can we can debate the specifics of that. My turn. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to tabling it for a month. I don't believe that's necessary because this takes has three readings of an ordinance which takes a month and a half to go through. So each if we approve reading one today, you still have four weeks to discuss the issue. Uh, I've heard a lot of comments outside of here, the telephone and so forth. I've listened to the comments tonight and you all know the objections that I raised before. And if you add these public parking and on public property 
uh, or public parking lots and, and, and public property, the safety issue, uh, I haven't heard anything to change my mind. I think, and I would move to approve Ordinance 331, the first reading. Or 333, pardon me. There's a motion. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Yes, I would like to ask um, how to consider the fact that we will be having a black rock check when all those hungry students come and how no vendors will fit a student population like that. Where would, should there be a truck, where would they go? I have one other comment before we vote. Uh, Mark, I contacted the chamber early in June, asked for an opinion. Jolyn said that she would take it to the board, which was the following Monday. Uh, two weeks ago in July, I called. There was still no decision. Now we're in August, and we're looking at another month. I wouldn't think that if there was a real interest in the business owners that would take that long to contact business owners and get an opinion and form a position. Now, you, you got another, if, if we go through with this, you got another two weeks or four weeks to come back in two weeks and another, there's a second uh, meeting in two, week, uh, two weeks after that to bring forth your position. Dave, thank you for contacting the chamber. You were the only person out of anybody here who contacted the chamber on a clearly business issue. Thank you. We meet once a month. Our agenda was already put together. Just like this, you can't add to your agenda to, to make a motion. We have done it as quickly as we possibly can without calling another meeting. Um, that's why we have not addressed it. As soon as this has come to our attention, we have been active in this. And so that's why the chamber has not been active and given you a response. That's why we are asking for some time. And again, I ask, why not? You can waive all the readings on the first one. You could do that next week or next council meeting. So you could do it faster than a month. We're asking that you wait. Now, after I left the podium, the mayor mentioned that by doing nothing, by tabling this, you can't have mobile businesses. I'm not sure what has happened since last year when you had a mobile business, issued a permit. I don't remember council action. I don't remember an ordinance. So I ask, what's different? Why can't it? Because you're considering an ordinance? Is that, I mean, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> why can't we? I have a question. As Chamber of Commerce, have you taken a vote of your members? Because you have a very diverse membership. We do have a very diverse membership. And if you email your members, what replies have you gotten back from a question to the membership? We always have an open door at the Chamber. Always. As you know, and I've told you this before. If you have an opinion, please let us know. We have not surveyed our members on this. However, we have talked to an awful lot of businesses about this issue. For every issue that we come up with, we can't survey the membership. I ask you, do you survey the members of your constituency every time you have an issue? No, it makes no sense. We can't ask them every issue that we go into. But we do have an awful lot of sharp people on that uh, chamber board. And we are looking at this. What we would like to do, and we have 
an open invitation to the mayor, the city administrator, and the mayor's assistant to come and speak to us, give us an overview next week on Monday morning. We have already con been contacted by one of our members to come and speak to us. And um, had we found Mr. Tracy's uh, information as of yesterday, which we did just find it today, we are inviting him to come to speak to us also as a well-informed organization. And I'm asking you to be well-informed too before you move forward. It's, it's simple, you can do it quickly, Dave. Do it next council, at least after you've had the number one representation of the business community give you input. And once again, Dave, thank you for being the one person that cared enough about businesses to ask. Any other questions? Thank you. I do think uh, it is important to point out the chamber has been very deliberate um, in their process. They don't make recommendations often or, or, or lightly. Um, and coming from that world, I understand the, the difficulties of calling together a board. Um, I, I take a tiny bit of exception. I don't want this to become a back and forth, of course, and won't let it be. Um, this council cares very much um, about business. This council invests um, very seriously um, in uh, the business community, the commercial districts, our industrial parks, and specific businesses. So to suggest otherwise would certainly be disingenuous, and I'm sure it's not what the chamber meant. Um, that being said, we do have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? I would just like to say something. Um, out of respect for our constituents and for the business community, and because you know there isn't, there isn't a rush, there isn't an emergency, and this really isn't a crisis where um, a decision has to be made tonight. And I know I understand that the motion is um, to ban um, outright the mobile businesses, but I just wanted to say that I am more in favor of tabling it because there's no harm in doing so. There's no harm in request in honoring um, our our community's request to be a thoughtful a considerate, an informed council. Um, there have been issues that have, been brought, that have been brought to my attention that quite frankly, you know, I, I didn't think about. I certainly don't want to enact an ordinance that limits our ability to have an art fair on the square or have other cultural events that would truly, truly be an asset to our community and, and to bring more folks in. That's something that like um, the mayor said, we are, as a council, we're always looking at ways to improve um, the experience of living in Milton, to enhance um, what our community has to offer, not only visitors, but um, potential new residents. So in my opinion, um, we should take careful consideration before we outright uh, put a ban on the mobile businesses. And I go back to my original statement that I do not wish to be reactionary with regard to these issues, so I too wish to table it. No. Is, is Don still on the He's line? He's still there. We, okay. I can see his seconds ticking, so okay. I know he's there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. We, we do. Um, th this is obviously was never intended a year ago to be an issue that caused this much of a, an uproar. Um, uh, it was um, a year ago uh, um, a surprise to get an application uh, in the first place, um, and we processed it as we thought was appropriate at that time. It, it turns out in looking at it, it's, it's certainly not the appropriate license for that situation. Um, when we discussed last week, or two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I guess it was at this point, um, it was um, the determination of uh, a majority of the council that we should proceed with drafting of an ordinance. After hearing some of that feedback, um, Jerry and I and other council members drafted that compromise, a middle ground, a way to uh, achieve um, appropriate restrictions on the use of public spaces and public facilities, um, but also to allow um, for some, uh, some leeway, um, some exceptions, some, some variances. Um, this is a tough decision for the council, but there is a motion uh, on the floor, um, and we'll take a vote on that motion. Can you read it back? Sure. 
Alderman Adams made a motion to approve the first reading of Ordinance 383. Ordinance 383 is an ordinance amending Section 1439 of the Code of Ordinances concerning prohibiting practices of direct sellers. Alderman Striegel seconded the motion to approve the first reading. So to confirm an, an aye vote on this. An aye vote would be to approve the first reading of the <coughs> ordinance. And prohibit mobile vendors of all sorts. Thank you. With yes. the exceptions. Okay, Alderman Adams? Aye. Alderman Roosh? Opposed. Alderman Striegel? Aye. Alderman Welch? Opposed. Alderman Ladder? Opposed. Alderman Verwink? Aye, opposed. Alderman Verwink opposed? Motion opposed. fails two to four. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's the pleasure of the council? There are four votes in the majority um, who voted in opposition to approving the first reading. Um, if there's a motion to table, if there's a motion to uh, postpone this, um, now well, would be the time. Well, what would we table? We wouldn't table anything. It's essentially <laughs> tabled if we don't take action, but. Mr. Mayor, I would suggest then that given the council's vote, unless there's going to be um, any sorts of other suggestions to bring up back an outright ban, which would require um, a, a change in that vote that the, the next appropriate course of action would be to direct staff to work with the city attorney to come up with proposed alternatives for ordinances that would permit them. And, and I want to go back to, to the, the discussion that really kind of got us here 15, 15 months ago. Our code on this is silent. So when, when people say that other communities permit them, there's a distinct difference between allowing them, meaning not having a law that doesn't regulate them either way, and having a permit process. Um, the pr what we're proposing here is a permit process, because if someone came into the city tomorrow and started selling area rugs in Goodrich Square out of the back of a pickup truck, or set up a card table and sold $20 Rolexes, our code doesn't give our police officers or our code enforcement any direction on what to do with that either way. So it's allowed then? <laughs> It, it, it is because there's no regulations against it there would be no enforceability to say you can't do that which is why when we, when the um, the business that applied last year had the direct sellers permit we had no other alternative other than to say this seems to make the most sense whereas the mayor has indicated in hindsight probably did not because it was not going door to door as a direct seller uh, our code uh, in this area is from 1968 and so it's a very very old established code and um, and other communities are, are dealing with the same issue so trying to find out how to regulate these, how to define them, um, is, is going to take time. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that we get it right. Um, and so I would suggest that that would be the direction that the council give us and we come back with alternatives on the permit process for which you would, you know, the, the law tries to encompass all sorts of different scenarios, but it's going to be literally impossible to cover every single possible one. And what we'll try to do is balance the use of public spaces, um, as we have done in the suggestions here tonight, with any additional tweaks from public input that may come from other stakeholders. Right, I can tell you the answer already. It was presented at Plan Commission. They do not intend in their renovation of that building to have a commissary. They're going to encourage their students to utilize business uh, opportunities for retail that exist here in the city. So that's clearly a, a good thing. Um, so no, there is no commissary planned in the, in the Blackhawk Technical College project. Okay, that's long enough. Uh, anyone? Do you want a motion or? We would need a motion to direct staff to continue to spend resources on the development of this ordinance, so yes. The question would be, do you want them to draft draft ordinances, or do you want us to engage in some sort of public input period? Um, it's really up to the council, but we do need direction, because this is going to take a heck of a lot of time um, to put together. Not that that's poorly spent time, but it will take time and resources. Well, and that's kind of what we're waiting on. I mean, we, we have put together what I would consider a, a, a pretty strong staff recommendation. Um, and it's been an issue that's 
been out there for 15 months. <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna tell, I'll, I'll just tell you right now that we can give you soup to nuts from what all sorts of other communities. What matters is, is that our constituents elected all of you folks to make this tough decision. And, um, and it, as the mayor had indicated, it is a tough one, but I, I would suggest the appropriate direction based on tonight's votes is work with the city attorney's office to draft an ordinance that permits them with appropriate public use uh, regulations. That, that's seemingly what the four to two vote said to me. And then when would we have this on the um, council agenda so it's clear to everyone? Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> when we have <laughs> perfect. Uh, we, we definitely want to get this timely. I'll be real honest with folks, and I don't, I don't mean to sound this in, in a negative way. This particular issue, in my professional op opinion, is to some extent presenting the city with a lot of unnecessary drama and distractions from all the other great things that we have going on. And whether it be, with no disrespect to the local media, the editorials about being business friendly, not business and friendly, somewhere in all of this, the, the truth about all the great things that are happening in the city right now are lost on this particular public policy issue. Seemingly very inappropriately for two issues. You know, people are, are going into dramatics about what we will or won't be able to do and Milton's business unfriendly and all of that other stuff, none of which I would suggest is true. Lost in all of this is the soon to be, you know, what's already happened in the grand opening of the splash pad, the soon to be celebration of an opening of the Parker YMCA and the celebration of Blackhawk Technical College's Advanced Manufacturing Center, unfortunately, none of which have gotten anywhere near the amount of publicity in the media as mobile businesses. So that's why I would encourage the council to allow us to work with Attorney Schrader, draft an ordinance that makes sense, not only with the input from the business community taken into consideration, for which I would love people to weigh in as much when we meet in two months and talk about how much we're gonna tax and spend, how much we set the water rates on, all of which impact the business community, for which we don't get anywhere near this amount of public input. So we'd encourage you all to come back in November when we vote on the budget, because that decision impacts as much as mobile businesses will far and above. So is this something that our Economic Development Commission should look at first? I, I don't know that, that the permitting process of mobile businesses has the impact on economic development that people would think that it would. It is, it's an issue of how you want to allow public properties to be used. Is if somebody comes up with a pickup truck and they want to sell area rugs on a city park, do we say that's okay or do we say that's not okay or do they have to get a permit? That's really what this issue would, to me would be about. Um, this is not something that goes back to a committee. This is a decision that's up, up to, to this body to make. Um, that, that's, you know, every two years we get a choice whether we want to keep doing that or not. Um, and the citizens get a choice whether they want us to keep doing it. So would, it, now would be the time to make a motion to direct staff to work with Attorney Trader to draft options that would uh, set a permitting process with appeals and all the bells and whistles. Alderman Verwink seconded. That's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Well, I just want to say that I am always excited when there's a lot of people at a city council meeting, and I don't care if it's a permitting process or it's a library <laughs> issue, but the more people here, the better. So thank you all for being here. The council has recently had three very lonely breakfast budget listening sessions, um, so it was nice to see everybody. Uh, so thank you very much for being a part of the process. Uh, we'll move on to um, the uh, discussion and possible action regarding 2013-23, 2013 budget amendments for the police. Where's everybody going? Uh, for police department. Uh, where was it? I don't even know. Carry over 2013 budget. This is a budget amendment that is just um, summarizing all of the additional um, expenditures that have been approved by council from January 1 through June 30th. The majority of the, this um, amendment is the um, savings for the health care plan and um, reallocating that to the planning um, for $20,000. The formality, we're required to have a balanced budget and we're required to be in budget by the line items that
that we publish in our resolution, and without these amendments, we would not be in compliance with the balanced budget. So <coughs> basically, it's the reallocation of the health care savings. It's the um, carryover for the um, police tuition assistance and the police CSO supplies, and the carryover for historic preservation um, operating supplies, as well as the capital purchases for the police department, um, $1,800 for a laser radar, and then the um, $8,000 for the um, cameras, squad car cameras. I'll make a motion to um, approve the resolution to um, carry over everything that needs to be carried over. <laughs> The budget amendment. <laughs> Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, Jerry and Chief, um, just for the sake of clarity, can we just discuss? I mean, I know some of these things are things that we had anticipated doing. Some of these are planned purchases. Um, can you just talk about the process of how, just so we make sure that we're clear on how the additional expenditures get there and, and why they're there and why they're there now? Well, if we're talking about the laser radar and those types of uh, equipment purchases, they're capital items that we need to continue with our business, actually. So it's not like something that we invented and we need and it's latest and greatest. These are things we need to just function as a police department. So that's where that's coming from. Sure. From an accounting perspective, when the department is, is awarded a grant, as it was the $4,000 Department of Transportation grant for participation in Click It or Ticket, we don't budget that as a revenue source, so then we amend the budget to put in the amended revenue and then the amended expense. So that's how it's classified. So none of these things should have been budgeted previously? Correct. Okay. And they were already approved? They were already previously approved by the council. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, item C, discussion and possible action accepting the proposal for auditing services from Hawkins Ash CPA. Personal and Finance Committee and discuss this and made the same recommendation. So I would move to approve the proposal. I second it. That's a motion and a second. Any further <laughs> discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Item E, discussion and possible action regarding Ordinance 380, amending Section 50-115 concerning possession of alcoholic beverages in city parks. I guess this isn't a story anymore. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As uh, recommended by staff and requested by the council, City Attorney Schrader did draft a ordinance for your review that would permit the consumption, or I'm sorry, the possession of alcoholic beverages in city parks. Uh, that is there for your review and possible uh, consideration for adoption this evening. I've got a lot of flack on this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. One from right inside my own kitchen. Pretty close. One of the strongest comments I heard was, this is the dumbest move you've made so far. Uh, 
I was reminded of when my kids were young, going to Little League and that, and the temperament of the crowds at those events, both Little League, Pee Wee football and that. Do we really need to introduce alcohol into that equation? I don't think we do. Uh, the, the folks that run those teams have a tough enough job that it is with, with sober adults, let alone inebriated adults. And the comment was made, uh, the chief made, that he hasn't seen any, com any problems currently. And I think the reason for that is that the, the only alcohol consumption is an organized events rather than just anybody that wants to just sits down in the park and, and drinks. And I, I know the, the permitting process was painstaking, time consuming. But maybe there's a way we can figure that out and simplify that and, and not go all the way the other way and just allow a free hand. Yeah, I uh, did vote for drafting it so it could go to council, but um, that still doesn't change my mind in thinking that we need to deny the liquor completely out of our parks. Uh, and and that, like I said before, I think this is just passing it from city staff to the police department and public works. And you get other communities where people don't, can't drink in their parks, well, let's go to Milton, because we can have drinks there and do what we wanna. <coughs> and like Dave said, with these little league baseball players and with our splash park, these people sit there and drink, and then they get in their car with their kids and drive home. Now, what kind of a message is that teaching our youth? It's okay to drink and drive. So I would not be in favor of alcohol in any park. But you don't want any permits for graduations or anything else? Well, you, that's why we've got this ordinance because you, they said we were contradicting the no drinking. No, I don't think it needs to be any drinking in any park, period. So 4th of July, no permit. Well, this, that's, the, that's, that's at the, a that's a school park. That's that a We have no control over that. Yeah. If they want to have drinking, that, then <coughs> that's her problem. Specifically, 4th of July is a license to sell. That's a different permit that goes through council for approval. Uh, not private consumption. It, yeah. This would be for private consumption. And I can just see, you know, you get these baseballs, and even with the the big guys that, that play ball, it, they're sitting there drinking. Like Dave said, you're going to have problems, and and it's not going to be controlled like it is with the permits. Would it be a compromise to have some of the parks totally dry where the kids' games are, and like the community house? No, because then everybody's going to want that park because they know they can sit there and drink. But I, I it does just, not have I, the aspect of games. And you're going to get people coming from other cities because they know, well, let's go to Milton because well, that's all free. The all the they'll, parks are free to drink at. They will pay for these. May I comment based on my experience, my going on 11 years with the city? When I began, I was informed of the park permit process, and they apply for park permit, and they'd like to have alcohol for private consumption, they apply for a beer permit. We have so many people that come to Milton because they can have a cooler at their work party. We have big businesses in Janesville that come to Milton and have functions in our parks because they can have a cooler with some beer for private consumption. I, For my position, I feel having permission to have private consumption in parks, certain parks, I think would be appropriate. I would say if we totally ban it, I think we would lose a lot of park rentals and, and people love coming and, and utilizing our parks. They like renting yeah, the community they house in Lamar. They do. They and drink. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and that's... But, I, but what about the people that don't want to sit there and drink and they have families? We, we're trying to make this a family community mm -hmm. and And not everybody asks to have beer at their functions. And, not all of them do. Go back to the same thing I said. Everybody thinks they have to have liquor to promote their business 
or to promote something. And, and I don't belong to the WCTU, but I still don't think that it's, you know, what kind of a, you know, go to Milton. It's got all the bars and the pubs, and now they're going to let you serve beer. You can have all the beer you want in the public park. Well, I know having rented the community house several times with the association, boy, that's the driest batch of people going. But they have the choice. So about two of the persons have a cooler with beer. The rest of the, and pay for the beer permit. This is not. Um, well, I think we're losing focus of what the problem was and why we had the ordinance drafted. Is the difficulty was we had we had a rule that said you can't drink in parks, but we made all these exemptions and we were constantly drinking in parks, <laughs> anyways. Um, and there really was never an issue from what I have heard from the chief, a safety issue, a public drunkenness issue, there, has, has there, there hasn't been an issue. Although it's true we may have future concerns of issues, typically past behavior predicts future behavior if there's an issue that's something that we'll have to address. Then we got, we were on one side, we were so extreme, if you were a day late, you weren't getting your permit. And we did that to a number of people and then all of a sudden, Oh, well, all right, well, you rented Shilberg and you didn't know, so now we're going to waive that. And then we, so then we, we're all over the board. So we have to have something that's consistent, that makes sense, that's thoughtful. So I guess if you don't like this ordinance, what are our options <laughs> from the, the, this the, the reason that we put it on the agenda was that it, we were making it difficult for people to use our parks with the with the, the, the background check process, the permitting process, and all of that. Um, my only concern, my only priority is that we make it easy for people to use the parks responsibly, obviously. I don't have as strong of feelings as uh, Alderman Striegel. I don't have um, you know, a particularly you know, liberal point of view either. I, you know, I was the one who thought it shouldn't be where the youth sports were um, last time. Uh, it, it really, um, all, it, all we should do is make sure that citizens and visitors can use our parks responsibly as easily as, as practical. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I, I agree the, the mix and match policy, if, if you pay the, the, what was the extra fee, doesn't make sense. I, I just believe that with absolutely no restrictions at all, if the chief hasn't seen any problems before, he's going to see them now. Mayor, can I weigh in? Yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait for Dave to, to start. Well, you know, it just, uh, to me, makes common sense that the reason we haven't had problems is they've always been organized events, and the people have policed their own events and, and made sure that, you know, things didn't get out of hand. And, you know, with the events that are held in Sherbert, with the amount of people that are involved, they could easily get out of hand, but they're well organized and they're well supervised. And just to allow anybody to plunk their their cooler down and a picnic table anywhere in, in the city, that'd make a lot of sense. I don't know what you chief think, chief, but I think I'll put you on the yeah. spot. Yeah. Why don't you jump? But in? I will. You're for money. But, but I will. Yeah. yeah. No, I I am totally against people drinking when there's youth activities. Schilberg, that's their deal. But if there's youth sports or organized athletics going on, I'm not crazy about it. I, I do realize that in this day and age, people have gotten a lot better on drinking and driving, and they're very good about having responsible people there. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on this one. I, I do see the potential for more problems. However, it, has, it really does seem the culture has changed quite a bit in the state not to the point where it should be, but people are a lot more responsible. We did have a previous list that was handed out at the last meeting of virtually every community on that list permitted alcohol in their parks without a permit process. And uh, there were even communities on that list that allowed people to have open intoxicants throughout their community. Um, I don't know that I have read any, any statistics on those communities that they have any higher crime rate than Milton does. I, I, you know, I have no facts one way or the other. So I just want us to have a reasonable 
something reasonable, and it's difficult to go from one meeting to the next, and I feel like I have whiplash half the time because we go from one extreme to the other. Um, and, and that's really not fair to the public if, you know, one week we're this way and one week we're the next way. Um, uh, if you're done. done. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, Alderman Brewing wants to say. Go ahead, Alderman Brewing. Go ahead. Come on, Don, chime in. Okay, well, I, I agree. Uh, there's two, two issues here. When there are youth sports going on, it would be foolish to allow people to drink there. Being an umpire at youth games that I've, that I've done, you get people who are obnoxious enough without drinking. Right. And, I'm, and I'm afraid that, that if you allow drinking, you're going to have a confrontation with a parent and an umpire, which would cause a problem. Um, but at the same time, we haven't had problems with adult events where there's where, where people have gotten a permit um, and they're supervised. I mean, I have no problem with an adult softball tournament having a beer permit as long as they're supervised by an adult, but, but keep it away from youth sports. So if we can come up with a process that will allow us to do that. I would be that would be make common sense. You know, common sense. I would be all for it. I mean, I. I'm like the mayor and, and Maxine and Dave. I don't want to see that youth sports. It's, it sends a bad message. But adults, adults would be okay in my mind. I and mean, I think that that's the process that we've been going through. So I'm going to make it easier for our staff. How we can do that, I don't know. <coughs> Go Thank you, Mayor. Attorney Schrader and I, I were just discussing that and trying to meet the council's objectives. The only administratively feasible way from an enforceability standpoint that we see that that would work would be that you would have certain parks that that uh, consumption would be permissible and then certain ones where it would not be permissible because with the youth sports schedules and fields and and those are issues that I, I know Don you and I have talked about with my affiliation with coaching baseball that you know people play at different parks and so you would if you would want to do it that way and say we want to completely keep it away from youth sports then that would dictate where the scheduling of youth sports would take place. Certain parks would permit alcohol consumption, certain parks would not. That would really be the only way that I would see that, that being feasible. I want to take a little bit of a step back in, in that um, the primary purpose, as Anissa had brought up, would be, and, and the mayor had talked about too, is to make it easier for people to use the parks. Uh, I'm a firm believer, like Chief is, we don't need to necessarily introduce more alcohol opportunities in the world. There's certainly plenty that exist. At the same time, I also, um, based on having sat in this room in a variety of different positions, uh, know that when different pieces of legislation, either coming down from the state and then passed down to the local level, came forward, and we've had to change our ordinance to adapt to those, sometimes, and, and I've been guilty of this as anybody, that there's an automatic assumption that the human beings will be their very worst. And, and, and I use that <laughs> example with respect to open carry legislation and concealed carry legislation. I'm a firm believer that we didn't need to introduce more weapons and more people carrying them into the world, in large part based on my previous career. But knock on wood, it has not created the catastrophes that many had thought that it would. I would suggest the same thing, that the majority of the people who go and, and watch youth baseball or youth soccer, I'm certainly not suggesting that, that the change in this ordinance will necessarily have the dramatic impact and changes in human behavior that it's going to be Bloody Mary Saturdays at youth soccer in the morning. I, I don't believe that would be the case. Uh, that's right. I, I, I just don't believe that'll be the case. I do not believe that there will be wild parties at youth baseball games because people are there, children and families, they're engaged to watch their child, their grandson, their relative play. Um, and I base that assumption based on what the research that Michelle had done with other communities. We just don't see that being a big problem. Um, it could be. And it could be a very not good problem, as Alderman Adams suggests. There's no doubt that an intoxicated subject, whether drinking at the park or drinking at their home before their park and went to the baseball game, could come and go bananas on an umpire or a coach or anything like that. So I don't know that our rules would either prohibit that or encourage that behavior. I just think that they would, the changes that we propose will make it easier to use Milton's parks. That's what I think. Gary. Yes. What, uh, what about if we... Like if people rented the shelter at Lamar Park, if they, if they could drink alcohol within the confines of the shelter and stay away from the ballparks, there are games going on. And, 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 and they still got the beer under their belt and they can still cause a problem. 
Anyway, mm -hmm. typically the people that are going to be like that are, are the people that are going to, like Jerry said, if they have a drinking problem, they're going to drink at home before they come. You know, I mean, that that's really, really what my experience has been. Beth Drew, um, I don't know, Town of Milton, I don't know what hat I'm wearing right now. Um, hi, again. Uh, I'm wondering if, because generally speaking, if there's an orga organized event, they have to come to you because it's they're renting the park or they are exclusively utilizing the park. So could you just look at it from that aspect that if they are utilizing the park and want sole usage of it, that then you would ask that question, whatever your ordinance would read. So that then you would have that, you would take youth sports out of this completely. I mean, you could, you could also legislate and say no, no youth sport event, sporting event would have accessibility to, to alcoholic beverages. But I'm just thinking that you have a sense of control. If I approached and wanted to have a graduation party using a community house, and which was my other question, didn't, isn't that, leg, that's dry anyway? Or do you have options? See, I live in a bubble right now, I'm sorry. I, I've got a couple of things going on, Nancy. Uh, but no, this was the question that uh, the, the $5 beer permit allows you, but that's nonsensical, you know. Let's, let's let Beth. But my question, I guess, is, or, or a statement is that over the years we've discussed having potentially um, a pre 4th of July event or a pre chicken barbecue event that might involve alcohol, that would be an exclusive use of a, of a park, and then we would have to approach the city and pay that permitting fee, whatever deemed, mm -hmm. whatever that fee structure looked like. But I think you would have that control then and take the fear of youth and because it doesn't mix. I, I completely hear what you're saying. Um, and it, however, I've had the experience of having inebriated parents come to sporting events. So again, you're right on the mark with that. But um, so that's my point. I think the difficult thing is that uh, youth sports don't schedule use of the parks. I mean, they, they, I certainly haven't when I've had to move soccer practice. And they do. Thank <laughs> you. They, they, do, they do come and request use of the parks. We have applications on file for the youth soccer that would like specific dates for practices for games. So then we would and say you can't because somebody's already using it to drink alcohol, so you can't have your practice. Well, here's, here's the issue. Another angle to look at this is Lamar Park is very large. We could have 20 people come in that say, I'm just going to have a small get together. It's going to be a little cookout from noon to four. There's 20 of us. We want to have beer. And it just happens to be a morning or an evening where there is youth sports going on, totally different parties from each other. That's something. Right. Uh, if it's happened, it, it, we don't know. So why can't we continue the way we were? Where the we, permits only raise the price. We have to change our ordinance regardless. I think we should well, keep in mind budgets and ordinances and everything we do should be reflective of our community values. Um, and that's the most important thing. I think one of our community values is accessibility to our parks. I also think one of our community values is, you know, that family friendly sort of a kids can go anywhere and they're okay set kind of a thing. So we've got to weigh that. Um, it's, uh, my only hope was that we would stop turning people away because they had missed the 10 day deadline when this came forward. So. There are probably some easy ways through this. Um, there are probably some ways we can talk about for uh, a while longer. Um, but um, if we're not prepared to make a decision tonight, we could certainly move on. Uh, if talking's not gonna get us anywhere, we can continue this at a later date. But right now I don't hear a consensus, and so I'm not sure. So then our, what do we do with our current ordinance that we said we really need to change because it's not consistent? Current policies, keep on yeah. keeping on, you tell Jerry and Mark and Michelle and to go back to the drawing board and work It, of alternatives. <laughs> is, is it the consensus of the council that we don't want drinking where there's youth sports going on? That is true. So anyone no. who doesn't feel like that's that's appropriate. I, I don't. I don't. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just not understanding how we get around it. If we have, you know, if we have a party at the community house and we have football practice at Goodrich, or we have, you know, concerts in Goodrich Square North and we have people that want to drink wine and we have a baseball game going. No, so how do we regulate that? Where's the, the, 
Here's a couple examples. The community house is rented primarily Saturdays and Sundays for events. There's no youth sports or practice that take part there. The park doesn't allow it. South Goodridge Park, the school district, Milton East Elementary, there's lots of youth sports that happen there, practices and games. We no longer rent South Goodridge Park. Lamar Park, again, primarily on the weekends, it's very busy. I think the football is there during the week in the evenings. We don't have a lot of rentals there. We don't knowingly issue permits where there is youth sports. But what about ju what about unorganized youth down. activities? If there's a family playing in the park, I mean, is it, mm -hmm. is it the kind of thing it, where then that preempts any kind of permit that we've got? And also? there's no way to regulate that. You can't say you can't drink a beer kids, in front uh, of a kid. <laughs> you really you can have You can have a private party at Lamar Park, and you can have a family reunion across the street at a private party, and they, all, they send all the kids over to go play on the jungle gym equipment. Right. It's not an organized youth sport, but you have a lot of youth around. We don't purposely allow stuff to double book, but we can't have a schedule of the Lamar Fields and Lamar Park. We rent out the pavilion. The permit says you keep the alcohol consumption to the pavilion. It doesn't say anything about allowing. It strictly says you stay there. What they do is out of our control. What happens at the fields is out of our control. I just don't want to see us turn away a lot of people from our rentals if we don't allow it. And right now, Janesville doesn't. And we get a lot they of people from parks. parks. They're starting to look around based on what we do. So if it's, go ahead, Don. As long as, long, as, long as we can find it within, within the shelter, and the, you know, I don't have a problem with youth sports going on. They can't take the beer outside the shelter. They can't come up and watch the games with a beer in their hand. You know, because and, and as long as they pay money for permit, I think that's the key. Is that is as long as they pay for permit, we don't we can change the ordinance. You don't have to do the background checks because that's the big issue. That took up a lot of time, wasn't it? Yes. But we but we can continue the permits, mm -hmm. and that way we know then when a group has alcohol there, they have to have their permit. But we don't have to do the background checks. But let's make the permit. You know, so they have to, that group is responsible then for drinking within that group, and if they not part of the group, and they bring a, and somebody brings a beer into the park, they can, and they cause trouble, they can be arrested for it. So would like the gathering place be the one that would get the permit so the people coming to the concerts in the square could consume wine? And as I'm trying to listen through this and, and, and balancing the ease of using our parks with the desire of the council to separate them from, from youth activities. I, I will tell you the challenge with that, and this is something that you'll hear in the 2014 budget development, is that our um, youth, youth sports groups, they r like rent those parks in perpetuity for the fall. I mean, they, they will come in and, and Milton Youth Soccer Association will say, we want King Park and Central Park from August 20th until November 15th. And I guess that's what I meant. Is yes. We don't specify what times we're there. Right. It's just right. we, we've got the parks yeah. indefinitely. Forever. Right. So, I mean, th there would be then, like, no drinking in Central from Park. From August 20th. From <laughs> August 20th to well, November, whatever. Right. Is, but no. Central Park Pavilion is adjacent to those fields. And if they have a Saturday morning game at King Park and there's Central Park for private, yes, the, cloaks, the, the parks are adjacent, but it's not together. We we haven't said, I'm sorry, there's soccer games going off across the street. That's too close to where your rental is, so you can't. Well, we don't ban it now is what you're saying. No, and I guess from staff perspective, all I'm requesting is that we kind of make a decision because we have people that want to rent our park. I had somebody come up for the end of September. They said, well, we, we want to rent the community house, and we'd like to have beer. And it's like, well, right now, I don't know what to tell you. So, you know, we certainly don't want to turn away anyone that wants to use our facilities, but... There has to be a decision. Now, where are most of the beer permits issued for? The community house? The community house is probably our most popular because that's year-round. Lamar Park is second. Um, Central, Park Central Park is, is probably third. Um, Central Park pro it has a little challenge because there's a hill. It's not as easy for accessibility. But Lamar and community house are, are the po most popular. Would it be um, a traffic jam if you limited it? the, the uh, liquor permits to the community house? Would that cause a traffic jam? No, it's it's first come, first serve. You have to fill out the paperwork and pay the fees and, and you get the date. And then the gathering place, can't, they can't drink wine for concerts in the park. 
No, they can th request. That doesn't respond to what we had talked about, though. Yeah. To make our parks more accessible, that if limits you, it. If you right. Eliminate the, uh, background check. Doesn't there need to be some proof of age somewhere along the line? Well, it is to be a responsible party <coughs> that it's rents the to park. Drink. I, I moment, don't know that we've had anyone. At the moment, well, you're no, just under the I mean, age. Do the form. I, I, folks, I, I, I would suggest this. If, if you want staff to come back with a, a revised permit process, because I'm sensing understandable reservation about a blanket you can drink in our parks, um, then we'll come back with a revised permit process that makes it a little bit faster and easier. I'll get staff input on that. Um, is that the things that I, that I don't like are sometimes people will come to us Friday to rent a park on Saturday and, and they'll want to have a beer permit. In our current process, just there's no way that could happen. And some, we're denying somebody the opportunity to have a great time in one of our parks. But you said you had applicants already calling. We still have a process in place to issue those permits. Correct. Yeah. You have the right. little book. Right. We're still issuing the permits, but... But we should raise the fee if it's not covering your paperwork and... It's not but that makes that it more. That, okay, our whole point is to make it easier, not make it well, more difficult. Know, it's, it's, it, if it's going to cost us money to to Here's, make these permits, from my personal perspective, I would encourage allowing beer in Community House and Lamar Park. We have lots of parks, but people don't rent them. If somebody goes and has a picnic, we don't know if they consume. We hope that they don't. We can establish the ordinance that it's only allowed in the two parks with a permit let's make a motion to have staff research this a little bit further and come back with some kind of uh, middle ground that uh, simplifies the approvals or the permitting process um, but also kind of maintains the the separation between youth sports and um, and then drinking events so moved <laughs> second All right, motion and a second any further discussion oh I know, I know. So close. It was ten, then it went to 30. Yeah, well, it was 10, then it went to 30. And what that did is it allowed um, adequate processing time for the background check. There's no, absolutely no rationale for. <laughs> yeah, there really is. It not. was parallel to our sellers, you know, the special events. Um, we meet again in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, yeah. The 20th. I can get this done in a day or two. <laughs> I know my recommendation. I have to, you know, prove my point and get all my materials and ducks in a row, and certainly I let the council discuss. The I know. Well, I know. So that's. Go ahead. I know. <laughs> but we try a lot on this council. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not condemning you for that. I'm just saying. And I'm an alcohol drug counselor, so. Uh, right. And that's whether we have a permit process or not. Exactly. And it happens at the community house when they don't have a permit. We know they're there with coolers because right. it's an enclosed building. Good. So. We have a motion and a second. Did, we didn't take a vote yet, did we? No, no not yet. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Let's just assume that everything's going to take six weeks to get done. Uh. That sounds like no a discussion and possible action regarding ordinance 384 <laughs> creating section 14 433 prohibiting alcohol impairment of operators while on duty this should be yeah, other alcohol related, uh, ordinance coming before us. this one is the uh, uh, impaired operator ordinance that mark drafted for us and it would make it an ordinance violation for an alcohol server, whether that's a bartender, someone working at the gas station or at the grocery store, from being intoxicated and serving alcohol to other people. And the way that the ordinance is drafted, it would make it uh, the police would not be doing random checks of operators to make sure they're sober or drunk or whatever. We would, it would be event-based if the police were called to an establishment and we suspected that person was impaired, we would administer a portable breath test to them. If they were over the .08 limit, then they would be uh, detained and taken in for a breath test at the police station. And if they were impaired, 
and then they would be issued the citation and released if they had no other violations pending at that point. And you believe this ordinance addresses those issues completely? I, I do. It's, it's it, the situation where we have a drunk bartender on duty and we have no other way of taking care of that person other than by this ordinance. This, this will take care of those situations. I'll make, I'll make a, mo a motion that we um, approve the first reading and waive the second and third and adopt ordinance 384. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. You got to talk faster. <laughs> he's all right. He's good. <laughs> he's a getting delay. Call. He's, he's multitasking. Phone's probably almost dead. <laughs> discussion and possible action regarding resignation except acceptance of the resignation of Roy Gilmore from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Gilmore submitted his uh, resignation from the ZBA to uh, Cliff <coughs> Ebert. Uh, he's grateful for his years of service on the ZBA, but uh, is no longer wishing to serve in that capacity. Staff is recommending that you accept the resignation of Mr. Gilmore. He has, uh, most people know, he moved out of the city. Um, I tried to go back to find out how many years he served. He said close to 30. I can find 12, and prior, I'm looking in the 70s, and I can't find where he was appointed. But I know he's been on for a very long time. He just volunteered and never left. He's done some great things. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> motion carries. You have to read I know, I can't. Just ask Don's <laughs> vote first. <laughs> Uh, discussion and possible action regarding mayoral appointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mr. Mayor, there were two applications uh, received and they are before the, in the council packets for your consideration. Uh, Mayor Frazier is recommending their appointment to the ZBA. Staff would recommend that you approve the mayor's appointments as presented. I make a motion that we approve the appointments as presented. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ah, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Motion carries. And for council to know, Larry is one of our new appointees on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, next meeting is next Tuesday. That is a special common council meeting. It won't be a full agenda. Um, it'll have um, one or two specific items. Promise? Is that a promise? Promise. <laughs> The only ordinance is related to... The, ne the next one might not have a full agenda either to make up for this. <laughs> no, it will. We're going to get business taken care of before I'm gone. But what time is it at? We'll just write in tables. It's 6 o'clock, yeah. Um, Mayor Alderperson's reports. Any Alderperson's reports? Oh, one item. Uh, I was contacted by Representative Jorgensen's office that... Uh, Senator Cullen and his staff are going to meet with United Ethanol, and uh, I sent him the report that was issued yesterday, and uh, he wants to keep those co those copies coming to him, and I will do that. And as soon as we get results from uh, Cullen's visit, he was asking me if we're interested in meeting with Jorgensen and his staff and United Ethanol in the city. I think we are, but I don't think we want to do it yet. Yeah, right. so an ongoing, something has to happen. Good. Any others? Okay, staff report, city administrator. Uh, just a couple of quick things, Mr. Mayor. One of them being, uh, and it will be uh, released soon, but as shared with you earlier, the city's uh, bond rating was affirmed by Moody's and Associates at A1. That's something I think all of you can be very proud of in the deliberate work that you do each and every fall as it pertains to our budgeting and capital planning, as well as our staff that, that manages their budgets. Uh, the city's strong fiscal management was cited uh, in particular at a time when so many communities, as many as 14 in the recent three months, have been downgraded as a result of debt and unfunded pension liabilities and all those other things. So that was some real good news. The special meeting next week is, uh, is a part of an ongoing process that has been published in agendas 
uh, with respect to uh, proposed annexation and growth of our industrial park. So again, as I had kind of illustrated a little bit earlier tonight, um, well, I want to apologize for these good debates that we're having about public policy. I do apologize for what I think sometimes becomes an unnecessary distraction. And the, I think we need to get these issues resolved and hopefully off our plate so we can focus on some of the many more positive things that we have going on in the city right now. Uh, so we'll work really hard at the staff level to make sure that we can get these issues addressed and resolved so they're, they're not taking up so much of your time and we can begin to refocus on some of the priorities of the city moving forward. It's not your fault, it's ours. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, their fault. They're, they're complex issues, and, and when we see these issues from a staffing perspective, we want the council to be fully aware of some of the challenges that they provide to not only the community but to staff and, and together, and then see if we can come up with it with better solutions. You know, and that's really the purpose of why we have these issues before you. It's never a bad idea to have a good debate. Uh, public Works. All right. It's Howie. Hello. <laughs> Police Department. We have a representative at National Night Out down in town in Hawaii tonight, and Tim Connors down there. And uh, just as a weekly update on our squad car issues, one of our dodges is that Boucher with a motor torn apart. Everything's covered under warranty, so it's it's shot. <laughs> That's the second motor on that one, and we had another one that we've had two motors torn apart completely. So. Doing with those. Just driving them around. <laughs> chasing people. They're all drag I, I think they need. I think they need to chase people. It's yeah. <laughs> we have had zero police chases, so See? yeah, it's so not. That's about. maybe our roads are bad. I don't know. It's, it's oh, that no. too. <laughs> Back to public works. Uh -uh. <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all good. It's all good. All right. Um, I feel bad. We make you sit through it all. So hopefully you'll get your money's worth. Library. <laughs> Uh, we just learned we were awarded a grant from the Growing Wisconsin Readers. Um, this Stacy applied for this to help fund her newest early literacy initiative, which is a 1,000 books before kindergarten program. So she's going to be working with the uh, 4K teachers on uh, getting it started um, this fall. So she'll get it um, probably September, October. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. Anything else? all that time thank you <laughs> I don't know I do apologize uh, city clerk nothing <laughs> I have a lot of work city to treasurer. do <laughs> I'm just um, want to update everyone on the conversion for the fire department books to the city hall um, computer system we have the chart of accounts in we're almost done importing all of the general ledger most of the employees are entered um, where you ha just have to uh, reconcile the prior two quarters. The conversion um, will actually take place on October 1st. That's been decided. And um, we've had full cooperation with the uh, accounting firm that they're currently using. And it's been a real smooth transfer. So it's been a very positive experience so far. All right, on to the next. Okay, consideration of a motion to convene into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute section 19.85, parent one, parent E, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public property, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. Reference EMS service debt service contract with the city of Milton, land contract for a property located at 110 Parkview Drive, and 19.85 per one per C, consideration, considering employment, promotion, compensation, and performance evaluation data of any public employee over the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility reference Department of Public Work Employees Performance Issue. That's a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 